There are many questions that folks have about what happens at and after death, and there are many different opinions and teachings that exist on the subject. Some say that when you die, you forever cease to exist. Some say that you're reincarnated after you die and you come back in some other kind of life form. Some say that you have a soul that continues to exist after death. And I'm sure that this only represents a very small portion of the various teachings and opinions on this subject. But with all these differences in opinions on the subject, how can we possibly arrive at the right conclusion? Can we really ever be certain about the things that are awaiting us at or after death? Or must we simply wait until we experience death for ourselves? Think about it for a moment. Those who are dead cannot tell us what they have experienced or what they are experiencing. Now, that's not to say that there are not people who have been pronounced dead for a very short time and then restored to life. Some of these individuals have even found a level of fame by trying to share their experiences. However, recent news headlines demonstrate that you cannot always trust these stories. For instance, Kevin and Alex Malarkey wrote a book that was published by a major Christian book publisher, Tyndale House, simply called The Boy Who Came Back from Heaven. And this best-selling book, which began to be published in 2010, tells a story about Alex and his claimed death and his ex- and experiences in heaven. However, Alex surprised many whenever he set the record straight, saying, I did not die. I did not go to heaven. Instead, he admitted that he lied in order to get attention. So not only can those who have experienced death not tell us about what they have experienced or they are experiencing, but those who are living cannot tell us about what we expect to experience beyond their own basic observations. Yet these basic observations about death can only provide some basic insight into the process involved in experiencing death. They cannot tell us anything about what, if anything, happens after death. How then can we know the answer to the question, what happens after death? Only God knows the full answer to this question. But fortunately for us, God has revealed some things throughout the pages of the Bible, which contains the words of God, according to 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. And within the pages of the Word of God, we've been given all the answers about death and what happens after death that we need to know in order to help us live in a way that's approved of God. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 indicates that God has given us all things that we need to know that pertains to life and godliness. So our focus should be upon what God's Word teaches us in response to the question, what happens after death? There's certainly a great need to gain a proper understanding of what awaits us at and after death. If we're honest with ourselves and believe what the Bible teaches about this subject, we'll desire to prepare our lives for death, recognizing that the ways in which we choose to live will have eternal implications for us. But if we deny the teachings of Scripture on this subject, it won't change any of the reality of the things that we'll discuss. This series of lessons, then, is aimed at helping you to gain an accurate understanding of what happens after death and how the answer ought to impact your life. The purpose of this first lesson is to help you reach two fundamental realizations that are necessary to this study. First, that we all have souls that will survive physical death. And second, that we will all die. Let's begin thinking about the nature of man. A proper understanding of the things which happen to us at or after death. Begin with a proper understanding of our nature. How has God created us? If we have only been created as physical beings, then we'll cease to exist whenever our physical lives end. However, if we've been created with another element to our existence, then we'll continue to experience something after we die physically. And upon examination of the scriptures, we learn of the fact that man is a dual-natured being. There is a physical element to man's existence, and there is a spiritual element to man's existence. This fact that man is a dual-natured being 
is a most significant fact that separates him from all other physical things. All other things with physical elements to their existence, like plants and animals, are only physical in nature. They have no spiritual element to their existence. However, mankind has been created in this very special way, and we'll consider the evidence for this claim and the implications of this claim momentarily. But I want you to think about first man's physical nature. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, it describes how God created man. It says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. In chapter 2, verses 21 through 23, it then describes how God made the woman. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Both of these passages demonstrate that God gave man and woman a physical element to their existence. Of course, This physical element to man's existence can easily be understood by basic observation. But now I want you to think deeper concerning man's spiritual nature, because the scriptures do not just teach us that mankind has been created by God with a physical existence. Instead, the scriptures teach that God also gave mankind a spiritual element to his existence. Notice what's recorded in the Genesis 1 account of the creation of man, In verses 26 and 27, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So mankind has been created in the image of God. But what image is that? What does this possibly help us to understand about the nature of man? Consider John chapter 4 and verse 24 and a statement that Jesus makes about God's nature. Jesus said, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. God is spirit. He is not a physical being with a physical body, although Jesus did exist for a short time in human form. So whenever the Genesis record says that man has been made in the image of God, this cannot refer to a physical resemblance. Instead, it must refer to the fact that mankind has been created with a spiritual element to his existence. In fact, as we'll continue to see, the scriptures plainly demonstrate the truth that mankind has been created with a spiritual element or a soul that will survive physical death and will continue to exist beyond this physical life on earth. However, before moving on to consider some other passages that further demonstrate this fact, look back at Genesis 1 and the record of creation, and you should observe the the fact that only man has been created with this spiritual element to his existence. Only mankind. You simply never read about God creating any of the physical things like plants or animals with a spiritual element to their existence. It was only mankind who was created in the image of God and was given dominion over all other physical things here on this earth. But now that we've established that mankind has been created with a spiritual element to his existence, let's now plainly understand that this spiritual element, this soul of man, survives physical death. Consider the following passages as evidence. when We want to spend some time going through a few passages that demonstrate this to be true. Let's go to Luke chapter 20. In verses 37 and 38, it says, But even Moses showed in the burning bush passage that the dead are raised. When he called the Lord the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. For he is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. In this text, Jesus points to the burning bush passage 
in Exodus chapter 3 to answer the question identified in Luke chapter 20, verses 27 through 33. The Sadducees, which were a sect of the Jews who denied the resurrection and the existence of the Spirit, as you can see also in Acts 23 and verse 8, they asked Jesus a question concerning the resurrection. Their question involved a complicated scenario concerning a series of seven brothers, each taking the same woman as wife after a brother would die and bear no children. And then they ask, well, in the resurrection, whose wife does she become? For all seven had her as wife. And Jesus begins to answer their question by responding that the physical, that that marriage is a physical relationship that only exists here on this earth. After the resurrection, there will be no more marriage or giving in marriage, nor is there any more death. And then Jesus makes reference here in this text, in verses 37 through 38, to the burning bush, bush passage to prove that the dead are raised. He said that there is evidence that the dead are raised in the statement that the Lord made to Moses when he identified himself as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now, Jesus said, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Therefore, whenever God claims to be the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, years after these individuals have experienced physical death, this is proof that these individuals and everyone who has experienced physical death still continue to exist. Next, I want you to go to Luke chapter 16. We want to look at verses 22 and 23. It says, So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments and Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. This passage finds itself in the context of Jesus' teaching concerning two individuals, a rich man and a poor beggar named Lazarus. Jesus' teaching begins by describing how these two individuals live very different physical lives. One man had all the things he desired to have, while the other man was full of sores and desired to be fed with the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. However, Jesus' statement in verses 22 and 23 concerning these two individuals indicate that both men experienced physical death. However, please notice that both of these individuals continue to exist after the point of their physical deaths. The beggar, Lazarus, was carried by angels to Abraham's bosom, and the rich man found himself in torments in Hades. The text then goes on to record a conversation between the rich man and Abraham and details the great torment that the rich man was experienced at, experiencing after his physical death. Therefore, this passage, as we'll study more in, in another lesson, demonstrates the fact that there is something we will experience after death, that our souls do, in fact, survive physical deaths. The physical element was not the only part of these individuals in their existence. Next, look at Luke chapter 23. We want to look at verse 43. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. This passage comes in the context of Jesus' crucifixion. At the time of his, of his crucifixion, Jesus was being crucified between two thieves. And during this time, one of the two thieves demonstrated a penitent heart, rebuking the other thief who was blaspheming Jesus. He said, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we have received the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Verses 40 and 41. Then this man continued and said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom, in verse 42. And then Jesus tells this man, in verse 43, that he would be with him in paradise that day. Now, from a physical perspective, all three of these men would die, as they're all hanging on the crosses, experiencing physical deaths. However, Jesus' statement indicates that both the thief and Jesus would continue to exist beyond their physical deaths. There was more to their existence than just the physical. For Jesus and this penitent thief, their physical deaths 
mark the point at which they would go to paradise. And we'll talk about that in greater lesson in, in greater detail in lesson number two. Next, in James chapter two and in verse 26, it says, "For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also." In this text, James was writing concerning the necessity of works for salvation. He states that mentally accepting the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God is not sufficient for salvation. In fact, James says that faith without works is dead multiple times in this passage in verses 14 through 26. He even demonstrates this fact by saying that the demons believe and tremble in verse 19, implying that the demons will not be saved because of their mental acceptance of Jesus Christ. Instead, James says that a man is justified by works and not by faith only, verse 24. And while James is making these basic points relative to the necessity of works of obedience for salvation, not works of merit, as Paul talks about in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, but as he talks about these things here in James 2, he gives us some information relative to the survival of man's soul past the point of physical death. Again, verse 26 says, that faith without works is just as dead as the physical body is without the spirit. So we can conclude that our bodies and spirits will one day be separated, and when this happens, the physical body is identified by James here as being dead. However, no such thing is said about the spirit whenever it leaves the physical body. In fact, other passages are helping us to see that the spirit, the soul of mankind, survives this separation. Next, if you'll notice with me in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I want to look at verses 1 through 8. Paul says, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now, he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Now, just prior to making these statements, Paul wrote concerning this great hope in that which is unseen and eternal in chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. And in that passage, he speaks of both the outward man and the inward man. The outward man was perishing due to the affliction he was experiencing and the natural aging process. However, his inward man was being renewed day by day as he was looking for the eternal things God has promised to reveal. In this context, Paul makes some further observations as we come into chapter 5 to the Corinthians concerning his outward man and his inward man. Paul plainly identifies a time when his physical existence, his earthly house, would be destroyed. He even references this physical existence as a tent. And note that a tent is only a temporary structure. However, Paul does not begrudge the thought of this time when his physical existence would end. He does not say that physical death would be the end. Instead, he said that he groaned while in this tent looking for the time when he could be further clothed with the heavenly body that God has promised, as you can see in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 through 58. Again, Paul is eagerly anticipating this time when he could be absent from the body and be present with the Lord. Clearly, Paul was looking forward to a continued spiritual existence after his physical death. Now, as you reflect upon these truths that we've thought about, each one of these truths, each one of these passages, help us to understand that the physical element to our existence is not all that God has created us to have. 
Instead, these passages all demonstrate that mankind continues to exist somewhere after our lives on earth come to an end. But what should these important truths mean for us today? First, they have implications for how we live our physical lives. We should know that this life is not all there is. We should know that we will all continue to exist somewhere after our earthly lives end. This then should cause us to evaluate whether there is any connection between the way in which we live our lives and where our souls will continue to exist. If so, we should desire to live in the way that will result in the best possible outcome. Therefore, the truths that we've established have the potential to completely transform the ways in which we choose to live our earthly lives. Second, these truths that we've established have implications for what happens to us after we die. The truths that we've been establishing have great implications for us to build upon as we seek the answer to the question, what happens after death? We could already know that we will not cease to exist at the point of physical death. Therefore, we can build upon this realization and continue our search for the truth about what God says will happen to us after we die. Well, having established these basic points and this essential foundation, I want to encourage you to continue thinking about the question, what happens after death? And as as we've established the fact that man is a dual-natured being while he lives on this earth, possessing both physical and spiritual elements to his existence, let's investigate some Bible truths about the subject of death itself. And notice the certainty of death. We need to realize that all will die. We are constantly reminded of this fact of death, that it is in the world, and that no one is exempt from it. We can look around us and observe that things are dying. Plants die, trees die, animals die. And not only are all these things dying, but people are dying all around us as well. Take a look in the obituary section of your local newspaper and take a moment just to reflect on how many people who live in your community have died in the last couple of days. Our loved ones die. Our acquaintances die. Famous people die. From presidents to athletes to wealthy businessmen and women to actors and singers, etc. In fact, when you really stop to think about it, we're all dying. Right now, we are all experiencing the aging process, and as we age, we inch closer and closer to physical death. So as we look around and observe that the death that's going on all around us, we should be reminded of the fact that we are all dying. We simply cannot escape the constant reminder that death is a common reality for all of mankind. But the Bible tells us this is so. Ecclesiastes 3 verses 1 and 2 says, To everything there is a, time, there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted. Simply put, there's a time to die for yourself and for everything and everyone around us. Now, this is not necessarily a fact that we like to think about, but it is a reality. However, rather than attempting to live in denial of this fact, we're taught the need to embrace its reality and that these reminders of physical death are actually very valuable for us and better than being engaged in recreation. Look at Ecclesiastes 7. And in verse 2, it says, Better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men, and the living will take it to heart. It is better not because it is more enjoyable, but because it's more profitable to us in providing us with the, pro with the reminder of our own impending physical deaths and the need to make the necessary preparations for that time. So the scriptures clearly demonstrate that there is a time to die. We must simply embrace and prepare for. Hebrews chapter 9 in verse 27 says, And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment. We each have appointments with death. We just simply don't know when our appointments are. 
Still, we can know for certain that we will experience physical death at some time in the future and that there will be a judgment after this. So we will go the way of all the earth. Two very prominent Bible characters recognized and embraced the fact that they were going the way of death as everyone who lives or has lived will gone or will go. In Joshua 23 and verse 14, Joshua said, Behold, this day I am going the way of all the earth. In 1 Kings 2 verse 2, David told his son Solomon, I go the way of all the earth. We will each go the way of all the earth. None of us will be able to take a different way. We will all experience physical death, regardless of our culture, regardless of our national, educational, political, or financial backgrounds. An illustration to prove that point can be seen from Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 22. Remember from our earlier discussion that this passage describes the fact that both the rich man, the one who lived in a life of ease and comfort, and Lazarus, a poor beggar, whose body was full of sores, that both of them died. The different way they lived their lives did not change the fact that they would experience death. This is because death is the common fate of all mankind. Now, as you recognize and consider the reality of death, it would also be profitable to know what God teaches concerning the lengths of our lives. And as you've likely observed during your own life, there is no guaranteed length for your life. Some die when they're well advanced in years. Some die when they're very young. Some die of natural causes that result from the aging process when they are old. Some die suddenly as the result of fatal accidents. Therefore, the only guarantee concerning the length of our lives is that there is no guarantee. Concerning the length of our physical lives, the psalmist wrote in Psalm 90, verse 10, The days of our lives are seventy years, and if by reason of strength they are eighty years, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. So a realistic life expectancy has been seventy years. However, sometimes a realistic life expectancy is longer or shorter than the stated 70 years. Either way, this is no guarantee from God for at least 70 years of life on this earth. Many never lived that long. Others live beyond 70, many years, even beyond 80 years. Still, you should notice that the end of these years is physical death as our earthly lives are cut cut off and we fly away. No matter how long we live on this earth, we can know that it won't be long. Consider what James writes in James 4, verses 13 through 16. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. This passage helps us to see that we should be careful about making plans for the future because our lives might not last long enough to fulfill those plans. Rather, we should be making plans with this understanding, making our plans in full recognition of the will of the Lord. Only if it is according to the the will of the Lord, will we live and do this or that. We must realize that our lives are not permanent fixtures upon this earth. Instead, as James describes, our lives are more accurately compared to a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. To To understand this picture, boil a pot of water and watch the steam rise and then vanish quickly from sight. That is your life on this earth. You are only here for a very short time. In fact, the man who lived the longest life, according to the records we have, was Methuselah, who lived 969 years before he died, Genesis 5, verse 27. And though this amount of years seems like a very long time to us, it's still very short in comparison to eternity. Now, what is death? You know, we're typically able to distinguish when someone is dead or alive, but what really is death? 
There are actually two elements involved in physical death. First, the separation of the soul and body. And second, vital functions of the body cease. The first part of that is, again, the separation of the soul and body. And while there are certainly physical elements to death, which we'll consider in just a few moments, the Bible also gives us even greater insight into the process of death. For instance, consider James 2, verse 26 again. It says, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Therefore, in addition to the physical things that happen at death, the Bible says that the spirit departs from the body. Death, then, is a separation. Man experiences physical death whenever the physical part of his existence and the spiritual part of his existence separate. Man simply is not alive without the soul. That's further demonstrated in Luke chapter 12 and verse 20. In the context of a parable about a rich man who put all his focus and trust in physical things, Jesus said that God told him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? Thus again you notice the connection between the soul of man and his physical life and how that physical life ends whenever the soul is taken away. Also consider the implications from Peter's statement in 2 Peter chapter 1 and in verse 14. Now in verses 12 and 13, he speaks of the need to offer reminders to his Christian brothers as long as he was in his tent, that is, his earthly body. Knowing, he says in verse 14, that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. So just as we saw in 2 Corinthians 5 in the first eight verses, Peter describes his earthly body as being a temporary dwelling for his soul. But there would be a time when this tent would be put off, and he would be clothed with a permanent spiritual body, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 through 58. A second part that's involved in death is that vital functions of the body cease. So we can conclude that death occurs whenever the spiritual element of man's existence, his soul, separates from the physical body. And then whenever this occurs, we learn that the functions of our physical bodies cease and the body begins to decay. Psalm 146 and in verse 4 says, His spirit departs, he returns to his earth. In that very day his plans perish. We'll focus on the spiritual existence of an individual after death in the next couple of lessons. But in these lessons, and in these lessons, we'll try to gain an accurate understanding of what happens to the soul of man after physical death. But for a brief moment, let's focus on what happens to the physical body after physical death. It is after the soul departs from the body. When the soul departs from the body, we're told that we take our last breath. I want you to consider the following passages and notice this language in Genesis 25 and verse 8. Then Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age, and an old man, and full of years, and was gathered to his people. In Genesis 25 verse 17, these were the years of the life of Ishmael, 137 years, and he breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people. In Genesis 35, verse 29, So Isaac breathed his last and died, and was gathered to his people, being full, being old and full of days. And his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. In Genesis 49, verse 33, And when Jacob had finished commanding his sons, he drew his feet up into the bed, and breathed his last, and was gathered to his people. In Luke 23, verse 46, And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. In Acts 5 and verse 5, then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. In verse 10, then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead, and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So at death, the normal functions and vital functions of our bodies cease. The functions of our brain stop. The functions of our hearts stop. 
the functions of our lungs to breathe, stop, the movements of our bodies, stop. Then after these, func- these vital functions stop, our bodies begin to, to decay. Psalm 146, verse 4, demonstrated that our spirits depart and our bodies return to the earth. After Adam and Eve had sinned, God told Adam in Genesis 3 and verse 19, In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Our physical bodies, therefore, go through a natural decaying process after death, that is, after our souls depart from our bodies. Now, consider, as we think about the question, what is death, let's consider that death is likened to sleep. In Luke chapter 8 and in verse 52, after Jairus' daughter had died, Jesus said, Do not weep. She is not dead, but sleeping. Of course, Jesus was about to perform a miracle and restore her to life as Jesus took her by the hand and called her, saying, Little girl, arise, verse 54. And her spirit returned, and she arose immediately, verse 55. Therefore, Jesus Jesus used the term sleep in reference to her death because of its temporary nature and her impending resurrection from the dead. The same thing can be observed regarding Lazarus in John chapter 11 and in verse 11, when Jesus said, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. However, the same terminology is used generally regarding death, because, as we'll see in the coming lessons, there there is an impending resurrection from the dead that will be experienced by all in John 5, verses 28 and 29. For instance, in Acts chapter 7, And in verse 60, it says that Stephen fell asleep as he was being stoned. And then in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, it says that Saul was consenting to his death. Furthermore, 1 Thessalonians 4, in verses 13 and 14, it talks about those who have fallen asleep in Jesus and assures that they will take part in the day of Jesus' return. Now. Does the fact that death is likened to sleep mean that there's no conscious existence after death? Some folks like to use Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verses 4 and 5, to prove this is the case. The text says, But for him who is joined to the living, to all the living, there is hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. And they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. So do the dead know nothing at all, in the sense of having no consciousness? Look at verse 6. Also their love, their hatred, and their envy have now perished. Nevermore will they have have a share in anything done under the sun. This verse helps us to understand that the discussion in verses 4 and 5 is relative to to the things that take place under the sun here on this earth. Thus, the fate of those who are dead are sealed. They no longer have a part in that which takes place here on this earth. In addition, you could look at Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31, which I referenced earlier, that this is a passage that shows conscious existence after death, both for the righteous and for the wicked. Particularly, We are given greater detail concerning the rich man in torments. And though we'll discuss the specifics of the passage in a later lesson, for now, simply notice how this passage discusses his, his consciousness after death. The rich man could see in verse 23. He could speak in verse 24. He could feel pain in verse 25. He could remember in verses 27 and 28. Clearly, Jesus teaches a conscious existence after death. So why is death likened to sleep? There are two things to consider. First, for the righteous, I want to underscore for the righteous, physical death brings rest. This can be seen with Lazarus in Abraham's bosom in Luke chapter 16 and in verse 25. And then you notice the things that are said concerning those who die in the Lord in Revelation 14 and verse 13. It says, Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, 
Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works follow them. Second, death is likened to sleep because those who have died are awaiting the promised resurrection. In John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, Jesus said, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in, his, in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. So those who have died are in a temporary state between earthly life and eternity, just like sleep is a temporary condition, which we'll talk more about the nature of this temporary state in our next lesson. But before we close the lesson, let's consider some fundamental questions that we all ask. Why do I have to die? Why do my loved ones have to die? And then as we answer these questions, let's make sure that we appeal to the scriptures to find the answers, rather than becoming angry and blaming God for the presence of physical death in the world. We are shown in the scriptures that God did not create physical death whenever he created the world. In the beginning, when God had created man, he placed man in the Garden of Eden and gave mankind access to the tree of life, Genesis 2, verses 8 and 9. This tree would give man the ability to live forever, Genesis 3, verse 22. So God made all of the necessary provisions for man to live forever by taking of the tree of life. However, death entered the world whenever man sinned against God. In Genesis 2, verses 16 and 17, God gave man a law to follow. He commanded him not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and he warned that in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Whenever Adam and Eve sinned then, if you look in Genesis 3, verses 1 through 6, they experienced spiritual death, separation from God in that day. However, as God also pronounced physical punishments for their sin, he identified that man would die and his body would return to the dust of the earth, Genesis 3 and verse 19, and he would be separated from the tree of life, Genesis 3, verse 22. So death entered the world at that time and remains in the world today. Consider 1 Corinthians 15, verses 21 and 22. It says, For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Physical death entered the world through Adam and continues to this day as many, and it has claimed many victims. However, there is victory over death that's promised through Jesus Christ. Later in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says that death will be swallowed up in victory, and that the victory is provided through our Lord Jesus Christ in verses 40, 54 through 57. However, in order to experience this victory, verse 58 says that we must be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. So as we constantly interact with reminders about death, let it constantly remind us of the consequences of sin. Death is not God's fault. It's man's fault. In fact, all of the negative things we experience in this world is not the result of God being cruel. Instead, it's the consequence of the rebellion that took place in the Garden of Eden. However, because God is a loving God, He's given each one of us the opportunity to find salvation from the sins we've, we commit through Jesus Christ and be given eternal life in heaven and be granted access to the tree of life in that place, Revelation 22, verses 1 through 5. We'll talk more about what God has prepared for those who faithfully serve Him throughout their lives later in this study. As we close this lesson, we've certainly not exhausted everything that could be said and could be considered about the subject today. However, I, I hope that what has been said is, has been beneficial to you. In addition, the points we've considered will serve as a good foundation for us to begin building over the next couple of lessons. First, we've established that mankind is a dual-natured being who has a soul that survives physical death. Second. We have established that we will all experience death someday, and we've considered what it means to die physically and why physical death is something we must experience. 
In our next lesson, we'll build on this foundation and discuss Hades, which is the temporary realm of the dead, and the return of Jesus Christ, and the things that we're told will happen on that day.